Paul, did you uh, did you get in your time machine today by any chance? <laughs> Why do you ask? Because Microsoft reverted everything. Wow. Well, I mean, explain. there might be a little overselling it, but yeah. But um, we're just gonna we're just gonna kick it off here because I wrote about seventeen hundred articles over one blog post that Microsoft uh, kicked out, and so as <laughs> I poorly alluded to yesterday, there was some uh, news coming today, folks, and we <laughs> we got it. Um, so remember how Paul Microsoft? Oh, very. No, I probably shouldn't. I'm just, Sorry, I thought just, you were talking. Yeah, yeah, I know. I figured. I was like, maybe I should. Every time he that. talks, I have to drink. Paul, Paul, um, has Microsoft <laughs> ever changed the lifecycle support of Windows 10 updates ever? Like, <laughs> yes, they have, and um, I will predict that they're going to do it again. Yeah, because there's this really big difference between what Microsoft originally started as the lifecycle policy and where businesses actually do upgrades. And Microsoft has moved, yeah, like over here. Yeah, they're, they're, they're getting there. It's, it's still over there. Yep. So back in, so originally when they launched Windows 10, they said, ha ha, we're going to make you do a whole bunch of fun stuff you don't want to. And by fun stuff, I mean, they were going to make you update roughly every year. You had 18 months technically, but they said, you know, test for six months, run for 12 months, test for six, and you're going to update every year. And then business was like, ah, you know, I don't think we can do that. And they said, okay, we'll give you 24 months on just some of these updates, just some of them. That's what they announced in February. They extended, they had an extra six months onto some updates. And then um, today they're announcing that, you know what, maybe that's not enough time. Maybe, maybe that's not enough. And so they are going to give you uh, 30 months now between well, updates. When you say you, <laughs> let's, let's be clear. They don't mean anyone listening to this podcast. They mean the biggest enterprises on earth. Yes. Only, you know, and um, this kind of pay for play thing I've always had a problem with. It's like the, um, you know, uh, the luxury cars are the ones that got airbags first and other safety equipment. <laughs> uh, you know, like I, I just no, I mean, it's it, it, I, it's fundamentally unfair. You know, uh, Mary Jo had asked me um, ahead of this event mm -hmm. uh, to, you know, kind of reiterate how does how does it work if you're on Windows 10 home? Like, what can you do? you know, to prevent a, a feature update from happening? And the answer is nothing. Um, well, you could turn on metered networking, but then you turn off all updates, right? Yeah. So um, I, I'm sorry, but that just, that sucks. Uh, and mm -hmm. I, it's it's unfair. It's crazy. It is. But anyway, anyway, well, if you have a lot of money and you're a big company, <laughs> like like in all things in today's America, you're all set. Um, but but it's fun though. It, it in very very traditional Microsoft fashion. It's not it's not exactly that easy. As Paul is alluding to, obviously, it to be an enterprise or education. Um, but they're only yep. giving thirty month support window life cycles for fall updates. So uh, yeah. basically, what they're doing is forcing every enterprise onto a fall update cycle. Because if you update in the spring or if you're running any of those, it's only eighteen months then. Yeah. So, by the way, that kind of thing is brand new. Um, the notion that a, a spring update, which is targeted for March, mm -hmm. and a fall update, which is targeted for October, are on different support life cycles. That's that's brand new. It's insanity, um, is what it is. And um, yeah, I mean, it's you know, from a servicing perspective, I think of it as an R two model. Although um, I was talking to Mary Jo about this, and she had asked Microsoft about this exact thing, and I said, mm -hmm. no, this does not indicate that. The, the fall updates will be bigger and the spring updates will be smaller. But I, and I only really meant it from a uh, you know, like a servicing perspective, but it does have right. that kind of, it's like a mini version of the long time servicing branch model mm -hmm. where, you know, one release out of so many is, you know, good for a longer period of time. Um, God, they, they couldn't, well, you know, no, that's not, I was going to say they couldn't make this more complex and yet they continue to make it more complex. I, 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 I you know, it's I lovely. mean, the Microsoft licensing yeah. scheme is more complicated than the tax code. I don't understand it, I think would be the way to say and it. And then so I, I talked with them yesterday, mm -hmm. maybe it was the day before, and I, I asked them, I said, you know, you guys are almost to what people wanted. Um, I, said, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was like very that. blunt. I was like, why couldn't this have been 36 months? Because that would have been one update every three years. Now, effectively, what they've done by 30 months, they're forcing you to do it every other year. So every other fall, you have to do an update. It was 36 months. You could have done every other or every third year. And they're like, well, we don't want people not touching their Windows installs for every three years. And I'm like, you guys are missing the point. That's exactly what they want. They don't want to touch their Windows installs other than patches every three years. Like that's that's the ideal scenario. So I 
Yeah, I, I, it is a fundamental misunderstanding or not caring of what your customers are asking for. You know, and um, I this is I call this parentalism. You know, it's mm-hmm. like Microsoft knows best. You know, Apple's famous for this, but Microsoft does it too. And um, you know, trying to enact behavioral change is just uh, it's just a losing strategy. They're, they're not they I this is going to drive companies and people away from Windows. I, I there's no doubt about it. Yeah, that's actually, I just, I wrote an editorial at the very end of all these posts and the title is actually mm-hmm. Microsoft acknowledges it can't force businesses to modernize their software because they, uh, yeah. they, they said, uh, yeah. Well, but the other thing is, you know, <laughs> there's a lot of contrary forces at work here, but businesses are in business to do whatever their business is. Right? So widgets, they, whatever it is, um, they're not in business to manage windows and office and whatever else is in this stupid scheme. Um, so, you know, you can kind of make, uh, uh, on the other side of this argument, you could kind of say, well, okay, maybe letting someone who knows mm-hmm. what they're doing, Microsoft, manage this for you makes sense. It's one of the arguments for cloud computing, right? Yep. You could have your own email servers, but who knows more about Exchange than Microsoft? Maybe we should let Microsoft do it. Um, it's a good argument in theory, and I'm not arguing against cloud computing at all. Don't get me wrong on that one. But um, the problem with this update stuff is that there is a rich history of mistakes here, and those mistakes cost companies time and money. Mm-hmm. And the reason they're not ceding control of this to Microsoft and the reason they're fighting this, um, what appears to them to be an arbitrary update schedule, is that Microsoft can't reliably do this stuff. They, there have been too many mistakes. You know, as an individual, if I get a little dialogue that pops up that says, hey, the, you should download the new um, Insider build and I'm not on Insider, you know, whatever. It's not the yeah. end of the world. But when support calls are coming in from all over a company, and IT is overwhelmed yet again with some artificial problem that, of Microsoft's creation, that doesn't engender a lot of goodwill. And it doesn't make people want to do this thing that Microsoft wants them to do. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's just they don't have they don't have the history to prove yeah. that this is viable. And it, I'm sorry, but this is going to keep changing. There's no way around it. Yep. And um, here, here's a fun little fact and i'll lead into the next topic du jour mm-hmm. um according to net market share which granted you can love or hate them but they're roughly accurate right we, we can use them as a baseline to saying hey this is roughly representative of the market according to them uh 40 of the market is still running windows 7 38 percent is running windows 10 so it's like oh great that's that's great windows 10 is about to surpass windows 7 market share um, mm-hmm. That is scary as hell because that means in the three years since Windows sure. 10 has been launched, um, 40% uh, there's still 40% market share of Windows 7, and they all have to upgrade by January of 2020. That ain't happening. It's not happening. Well, this is the the Windows 7 thing again, or I guess we call it the Windows XP thing again. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it, it's. Uh... <laughs> It's hard to go to someone or some company and say, you need to stop using this thing that you're using and th- their response is, but this thing still works. I don't understand. Yep. You know, um, a lot of windows usage, especially in companies is probably mostly single application. And I don't mean literal like software application, but it, it is, it is done for a single purpose of some kind. And that may be a single application. Um, I, we've all done this. You go to a doctor's office or a dentist or uh, you could be in a public transportation place or wherever. The, you look at the software that people are using in these places, and I always do this. I, should, I, I know mm-hmm. you must as well. And it's always fascinating to me to see something that looks like a, like a Windows 3.1 screen or a Windows 90-something screen or you know, um, something old. You know, XP comes up a lot. XP is a very distinctive-looking thing. Um, and... Uh, yeah, there are all kinds of concerns around security and privacy and blah, blah, blah. But it's like, guys, like they don't – this isn't their life. They, yeah. This is the tool that makes them do the thing they're doing. They're, they're not – you know, mm-hmm. it, it's like we we uh, used a hammer last night to install some stuff in a bathroom. And the camera maker isn't bugging me with mail saying you got to replace the hammer because we made a hammer out of a better kind of metal. And, uh, you know, it's better than the hammer you're using now. And it's like, what are you talking about? I've had this hammer for 15 years. It works fine. I, my life is not based around the hammer, you know, and I, I, I don't know. This is, yeah, this is, it's this fundamentally broken. 
Um, but the thing is, is if you are running Windows 7, Microsoft mm -hmm. announced that they are going to allow uh, <laughs> security updates through 2023, but they are not going to be free. And again, they're only for enterprise education. Actually, it's Windows 7 Professional, I think. And up. Yeah. Excuse and I think me. the price uh, escalates over time, right? It so does. the first year it's whatever price and it goes up X percent. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they really want to wean you off of that. Yep. And um, to help you wean yourself off of that, Microsoft announced that Office 2016, which was set to expire uh, in 2020 as well, mm -hmm. and the Office 365 connection portion of Office 2016 on all that good stuff, they're going to extend that to 2023. So literally the only thing you have to worry about in the Microsoft world is getting off of Windows 7. Not Windows 7 and Office 2016, so. Yeah, okay. So they announced, uh, yeah. yep. And then to help you, Paul, get off, they have mm -hmm. two things. There's Windows Desktop Analytics, which basically catalogs all the apps that are used in your environment and catalogs them and, and helps you create um, tiers to help roll out and test deployments. <laughs> that one's kind of boring. Uh, the other fun one is called Desktop App Assure which if you have even a single license of enterprise or education and you have an app that is not compatible, Microsoft mm -hmm. will assign an engineer to fix that in Windows for you. Wow. Any size customer now. That, I would that like is, this is a big deal. to assign an engineer to me to fix the problems I have with Windows. Well, Could I get that deal? How would I have to pay for that? Well, how much is one enterprise license? <laughs> <laughs> right. Let's see. Would this be worth it? I bet BWW could splurge for, mm -hmm. for some. Right. But um, yeah, so if you have an issue, Microsoft explicitly said they want to fix it on the Windows side so that it fix your problem um, because they've obviously heard that uh, people running Windows 7 don't want to upgrade. Well, <laughs> the big reason yeah. people didn't want to upgrade is one, if they had an app compatibility issue, two, it was more expensive to upgrade if you're having to update every 18 months. Mm. So they're trying to resolve both, both of those issues. And uh, But this desktop app, app, what the hell is it called? I can't even remember. App Assure. App Assure. Aperture. Sounds like Aperture Labs. <laughs> it from, does, yeah. Uh, a, that's funny. From, uh, what is that? Portal. Yep. Aperture uh, Labs. Yeah. But App Assure. It should be pretty interesting. And they're actually staffing up for this. I believe it starts in October for people in the US and worldwide in February. The question is, is that enough time? Because if you are, let's just say, in England and you start in February with the troubleshooting and then they yep. fix it and then they want you to upgrade to Windows 10, again, you can't just do that overnight. So, well, yeah, I mean, I, I just mentioned that you in passing because, uh, you know, we use Skype to do the podcast. We often have problems with, you know, I'll, I'll log in one day and it'll be like, oh, you're, you're on the wrong microphone or whatever. And mm -hmm. I haven't changed anything, whatever. Um, Microsoft, was it, was it yesterday? It doesn't seem like they would do this yesterday, but there was a, an insider build this week. Was it yesterday? I guess it was. I don't know. Anyway, um, I installed it on this PC. And at some point when I was done for the day, I realized I should d let it do the reboot thing and install that so I can, you know, get to work in the morning. Mm -hmm. And when I turned on the computer this morning and it logged into the desktop, I got all these little notifications at the bottom. And one of them said that it was detecting the USB device that I used to connect this microphone to the computer, which has been connected to the computer since I got it. Hasn't changed, hasn't changed ports, has nothing, you know. And, of course, my fear was, because now I'm a seasoned veteran of this kind of problem, <laughs> that I would be on the mar wrong microphone when I uh, when Skype, we started the Skype call. Now, to be fair to Skype and to Windows 10, I guess, mm -hmm. everything was fine. It worked fine. But these Windows 10 feature updates are, in fact, a version upgrade. It's, it's a ma major seismic change to the computer. Uh, Microsoft has kind of engineered it to make it look a little bit like it's not that big of a deal. Um, but it's big. And, uh, you know, if you're in the insider program, you've seen this. I mean, sometimes just going build to build is you, you're getting that experience every time. It actually takes a long time usually to install a new build. Um, and I, this is just one thing. It's one of, uh, you know, 20 or 30 something insider builds I've mm -hmm. installed on this PC this year. Um, I'm not going from windows seven to windows 10. I don't have to do any kind of weird migration or anything. It's, it's, although there literally is a weird migration going on under the covers. It's just upgrading a build, you know? It's just It just doesn't work seamlessly. I just thought of a terrible thing we should do at Ignite. And this is going to offend somebody, but I'm going to tell it anyways. Okay. We should show up in, like, military uniforms with a whole bunch of, like, random medals. And when people ask, we're like, oh, yeah, I survived the tour 1703 <laughs> or 1809. Nice. They could all, like, build numbers on them. Yep. 
<laughs> Win- Windows 2000 Service Pack 2. That would be like a huge metal, like a purple we can heart. Have, we can have little uh, stripes or whatever for like the Threshold and Redstone series or, or Red mm-hmm. Battles. <laughs> Just right. It'll look like a Janet Jackson concert. <laughs> I, I don't know why they hate us, Paul. I, 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 <laughs> I think we speak too clearly. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And so there's a lot of that stuff. I tossed a bunch of it up on Petra. I know Tharat. Or Paul wrote some of it up on Therat. Yeah, I just covered the Windows thing because all of it is enterprise-based. And really what I'm trying to highlight is a problem that extends to the consumer space, which is this notion that Windows is a service. I, God help them. I mean, they've actually they've, they've certainly improved it over time. It's been, That is actually kind of impressive. But we're, we're, we're dealing with a legacy code base here, and this is not mm-hmm. the right approach. And the fact that they give no options to people on Windows 10 Home to this day is just inexcusable. And then uh, to end it on some non-IT Pro-related goodness, I'm actually somewhat excited about this one Mm -hmm. Um, for many reasons. You'll explain, or I'll explain why, or you'll explain why, or maybe I'll learn English and pronounce things clearly. (laughs) Uh, But you will soon be able to control your Xbox with the Amazon device or the Microsoft device. I can't say either of my office blows up. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, You know, every step that Microsoft takes down this rabbit hole is going to cause a little bit of grumbling in certain corners mm-hmm. of the community and you know actually it's understandable um microsoft added basic Cor- uh, cortana skills i think it's okay to say that right yeah. um to the xbox you know at some point xbox one at some point and it's my understanding is that it's still optional i actually leave it off um but you know there's the hey x kind of thing and then mm-hmm. you could you could switch that to to cortana which i find a little more laborious to say uh, but they're extending the support and they're expanding it to the Amazon assistant, right? Yeah. Which is really interesting. Um, Stacy on IoT today, I believe it was her, wrote an article that said what I've been saying for a long time and what uh, anyone would uh, generally acknowledge is the truth, which is that the assistant uh, space is a two-way race and the two-way race is between Google and Amazon. Um, Microsoft has a partnership with Amazon, so... Here's another example of them doing that. But honestly, if they were being serious about what makes sense, you have a living room in your living room. Uh, you have a living yeah. room. You have, an, <laughs> you have problems with English. Yep. <clears throat> I have a living room and another living room because I live in a stupid house. But anyway, um, I have an Xbox in the living room like a lot of people. I have uh, Google Assistant devices around the house. In my case, you, I know you have Amazon devices in your house. Um, these things should all work together. you know. And uh, if, if Microsoft is serious about the living room, which I think it is. Um, they need to expand this. I, and so I, I know like right now people are like kind of choking on the Amazon part of the story. Mm-hmm. But what I'm saying is they need to go with Google as well. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see. But um, I'm not, my Xbox is not on the insider stuff right now. So I'll have to wait a little bit to be able to enable that. But it'll be, if I can just scream at the Sky computer to turn on um, essentially my entire office, that would be great because I walk, yeah. I play Xbox on this TV right behind me. The, Mm-hmm. Xbox is right on the other side. I walk into the office and I tell the Amazon thing to turn on the lights. And if I can tell it to turn on the lights and the Xbox, which would tr- in turn turn on the TV, um, I could just yeah. feel magical. It'd be great. Yeah. Well, I think it's coming. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it is coming. We Literally coming. <laughs> no, well, I, I mean, I think what you just described is coming. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So neat. Neat. Um, mm-hmm. Mr. Threat, do you have anything else for today? Uh, whoosh. not really. I did put up that health hacking article for people who are premium members. If you're interested in that kind of stuff, I know it's been a while. Um, yeah, nothing major, I guess. How about you? Um, I've been asked this a bunch, but I'm waiting to, to write it. Some people keep asking me to write up stuff about one password and how it's kind of working and all that. I want to yeah. wait until I get uh, iOS 12 and the new phone because the phone is the magical component. On the desktop, it's nice, but it's it's roughly as convenient as the one built into um, Chrome. I've actually got it mapped to my, my keyboard, so now all I do is just click in the password box. I hit it, one button on my computer, and mm-hmm. it opens one password, puts my password in, and hits enter. It's actually faster now. So did you, is this something you configure? In other words, you could type P or something and it would. Yeah. So what one password allows you to do is it comes with a universal, like, I think it's control all backslash or something like that to open the app. Okay. And yep. so I just map that keyboard shortcut. I think it's like F11. Okay. Or maybe it's page down one of those two. And I hit it 
and it okay. just opens up um, because I've already logged in to one password. It logged mm -hmm. logged in. It just it just works. It's very nice. Mm. Um, okay, that sounds good. Yeah, no, it, and I just want to wait until I get the phone portion done. Then I'll do a nice little write up about switching from that to LastPass. Right, and um, life goes on. Cool. Oh, the only when you other... get your okay, go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say when you get your new iPhone. Mm -hmm. Well, you might get uh, it first, so that will be awkward. <laughs> well, all right, but I mean, how, how do you, how are you handling your old phone? Like, what uh, are you doing with it? Well, there's two options right now. First, my wife has an iPhone Seven with a broken screen, so there's a possibility mm -hmm. that she might just take my old phone. We haven't decided yet. Um, if okay. not, I'm probably honestly just gonna sell it. But okay, in other words, but you're gonna sell it separately, not as part of that transaction. Yes. Yes. Okay. Because yep. one the, the reason I ask is I think if you can, what you should do is kind of compare the new phone to the old phone, including this OS thing, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it might be kind of an interesting thing that if you can have it side by side for a little while just to kind of... Oh, yeah. I mean, it'll definitely... Yeah, I can definitely do that in a day or two for sure. Yeah. Very cool. All right, folks, so that wraps it up for today. Tomorrow's show will be live, provided uh, the Earth doesn't get hit by a giant meteor. And you can find that information at threat.com slash live around 1 p.m. Eastern time or whenever Paul gets done playing Call of Duty. Have yourselves a good one.